Mate, so are you telling people where you where you're located in the world at the moment, or is that a um is that a special low key, secret? low key? Uh, so I'm somewhere. You're somewhere. <laughs> I, no, my parent. I'm in my parents' basement at the moment. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. They look up. I still live at home. Still I haven't know. made it out yet. Oh, that's how you've made all your millions. Yeah, exactly. Actually, yeah. speaking of made all your millions, are you still invested? When I last looked at your investment portfolio, you were heavily invested in. I think it was just. It was like 90% Tesla and was it 10% Google? 100% Tesla. 100%. Yeah. I, so in in 2019, if I recall correctly, it's, it's been a little bit, but in 2019, in around May, the shit hit the fan, Tesla stock crashed. And that's the point where I nuked a bunch of shares that I previously held, a variety of, like a smattering of just tech stuff, a bit of NVIDIA, a bit of this, a bit of that. Yeah. I'd made sort of two, three times my money on all of those, pour that into Tesla and then still held a little bit of Google and Amazon. Okay. But that's what I remember a year Google or two Amazon. after that, I had made a solid enough return there. Tesla had basically gone nowhere meaningful and it was time. So I've been all in Tesla, like literally all in now for three, four years, something like that. Yeah. And the the stuff that I had that wasn't in Tesla prior to then was like, it was a fraction of I think the most my, my buying strategy initially with my stocks was at least seventy five percent of the money went into Tesla even from early days, but as Tesla continued to grow and I continued to pour more money in there, that was never sort of below about eighty or so percent, and mm. yeah, for the last four ish years, one hundred percent Tesla. But I do own some real estate as well, so some people yeah. times people get confused and think that I only have Tesla stock as the only asset I own, but yeah. I do have some real estate too. I remember you mentioning uh, I saw that in a. A couple of videos. I think it said you had some apartments in Sydney, and actually, you might have had some houses in Sydney as well, from memory. Not houses yeah. in Sydney. I've got a house up Queensland, a development okay. site that I bought a while ago. It's yeah. actually my best purchase by miles. I've got That's... a funny story about that as well. I had an old boss that yeah. he thought he was a genius when it came to investing, and I he heard on the grapevine through my colleagues that I was buying a house up in Queensland, and he went, "You're going to lose all your money, mate." <laughs> He's telling me how all his friends lost all his money. Mate. Let me guess, bro. Let me guess. Your dumbass friends bought off the plan apartments in the oversupplied CBD. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'm like, exactly. I'm not buying a fucking apartment, bro. Relax. I'll, I'll do okay. <laughs> and it's gone on to do, yeah, it's best investment by far. Um, so, yeah, but I haven't bought any real estate since 2015 was the last one. I just continue to hold it and milk it for more Tesla shares when I can. Yeah. So you can use some of the equity if you wanted to, to buy more. Well, that's what I've done. Yeah. Every time there's an opportunity, I get valuations done probably every six, 12 months, refinance up to 80% of oh. all the money straight into Tesla. It's like a ATM without yeah. the risk of a margin call. Yeah. That's your strategy. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, I mean, I got it and I may as well hang on to it. And every time there's equity available. Yeah, of course. And there's always equity every, every year or two, sort of worst case, every three years, there's more equity available. My story is I tried to use equity based on, in fact, significantly from a lot of your research. This was many years ago, maybe oh, 2017 or something, 18. I, anyway, I don't remember exactly. I called the bank and I said, bank, I want $200,000. I want to invest in Tesla. And mm -hmm. this, was, this was before Tesla's, you know, and I yep. was just dead set convinced it was mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. they, said, they said, no. They said, oh, if you yeah. want stocks, you've got to do this, this, and this. They made yeah. it really, really difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I sh what I should have done is sold my house. That's what I well, no. yeah. What you should have done is speak to a mortgage broker who works for you and not the bank. That's where you fucked up. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. If you had gone to a mortgage yeah. broker and said, here's what I want to do, you would yeah. have got the result. So you know this because you were a mortgage broker. So you Correct. know how to do all Correct. this. The yeah. banks have no idea what's going on. They have a boss to answer to. It's their employer. They all have different policies. You need to talk to somebody who has expertise in the lending policy of each different lender. So you go to the bank and they say, well, our product says this, you can't do that. No, they've had rules in how much money you can take out as in terms of dollar amount, loan to valuation ratio, what you're doing with the money. Yeah. You go to a broker and say, look, I've got equity. Mm. I'd like to invest this in the stock. They'll find a lender that'll actually find an option for you to use that equity. It, okay. Yeah. Because that, the thing is, people don't really understand this. The bank works for the bank. A broker works for you. A bank can only tell you what that specific bank can do under their particular policies for you. And often people go, well, the bank said no, therefore I can't do anything. You go to a broker, you tell them what you want to do, and they will find a solution if one is possible. Because they've got a panel of lenders, dozens and dozens of different lenders, all with different policy. All the banks have different policies about how much cash out. It's, it's a complete sort of open book in terms of what can be done. But certain lenders fill certain niches. And if you don't have a broker that's that has is completely across all the policies, you never get the right result. But you go to a broker, 
nine times out of 10, you get the result you want. Whereas the bank, they can only tell you what they can do. It's not their fault. But if they don't have a policy that's suitable for you, they can't say, well, maybe you should try this lender or that lender instead of us. Yeah. They'll just say, sorry, can't help. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where, I, I don't remember you, you initially talked about your portfolio and you, you had, a, I think, a couple of million in Tesla. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Something so you're, like all, that. you're all in all the way, right? What? Well, since 2016, almost every spare cent that I've earned, and technically now when you consider the shares I did hold and then sold and bought Tesla, everything yeah. that I've earned and then some because of the equity as well has gone equity, into Tesla. Yeah. So it's not just income, but yeah, equity from real estate from that period of time as well. Do you then have a prediction for Tesla stock price in 2030? Um, yeah, I model things out. I mean, I don't, I don't predict what the stock price will be, but I do have some different scenarios. If they produce this many vehicles and the margins of this, if they do this much in software revenue and they do this much in terms of profit, is where the stock is. Um, but it's it's all just an exercise in intellectual wankery because we don't know exactly what the numbers will be. Yeah. I just probabilistically try and guess what the company looks like in terms of the earnings and revenue and put a reasonable multiple on that. And yeah. If I if I was to hold a gun to your head, hmm. what would be your number for 2030? No, I don't actually know what it is. I mean, I just put I put the different scenarios into my evaluation model and whatever the output is, it is. But I'm not I don't focus on what is the fair value estimate. I just go, well, how many vehicles are they probably gonna do? What's the take rate on FSD? My best guess, probably it's like a 10X from where we are or more from where we are today. But yeah. I, mean, I don't know. You got, if you guys want to see, go to check out my Patreon. It's on there. I don't know what it is. Yeah, so you I'm do. Not, you I'm do not a... focused on the, the output. I'm just focused on the inputs. What's my worst case scenario for production, for revenue from software? How many people are taking on FSD? How many robo taxi fares? How many cents per mile? I just plug that all into the different scenarios and then it makes an output. But I don't, I don't remember what the output is because I don't care. I'm more just trying to model the different probabilistic sort of scenarios, worst case, best case. So I couldn't tell you. Well, my Patreon subscribers can tell you. It's on there. I just, I don't pay attention to it. Okay. So yeah. it can it can fluctuate based on those numbers? Quite dramatically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if for example, if the, the, the robo-taxi fleet is a year late to start deploying or a couple of years later, that has a dramatic effect over the next sort of 10 years because the bigger the fleet, the more fares that are happening on robo taxi, the yeah. more revenue, and it's very high margin revenue, that can have a dramatic effect. The overall shape for Tesla, I think that the company valuation wise now, many, 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 many times what it is today in the future. But the exact timing on that, don't know. And the thing with autonomy is it's such a a needle mover. There's so much leverage in terms of the profits that that will bring in. That yeah. If that shifts a couple of years into the future or a little bit closer, it has a huge effect over the near term, but long term roughly ends up in the same place. Interesting that um, the robo taxi event was paused from August to October. What's your take on that? Is there a, what, well, what you well, Elon said that he just wanted to make some design changes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you know, that's the boss. He says, listen, bitches, we need to make some changes. <laughs> they make the changes. Don't know what it was. It could have been anything to do with the doors, the, the boot, or I don't even know what you call yeah. it in the US, the trunk. Um, yeah. Or something along those lines. But yeah, it didn't seem to be a major thing. It's just a design change. And obviously, if you're going to make a design change, you've got to update your prototypes. And yeah, you can't just do that overnight. So Elon Musk, he owns XAI, right? Which is his own artificial intelligence company. And obviously, Tesla mm -hmm. are going to pay them, it sounds like, for their services. It Could this influence what happens with Tesla stock price? Could some of the potential growth go to XAI instead of Tesla? Well, Musk did respond to some comments, some reporting that was, he sort of debunked. There was some thoughts about revenue share. I think at yeah. this point in time, it's quite obvious that XAI has a language model, Grok, which will end up in Tesla vehicles. You'll be able to interface with it through language to speak yeah. to the vehicle, right? So it's obviously there's some synergies there. Uh, in addition to that, Tesla has the real world AI, the real world data that no other company has. And unlike a language model where anyone can scrape the internet or a portion of it and create a language model, there's no other company that has that real world AI. Tesla's also working on a humanoid robot and the two pieces of the puzzle to have a useful, intelligent humanoid robot is that real world AI. You need vision, but you also need the language component as well. Mm. And so Tesla has something that XAI needs and XAI has something that Tesla needs. So there's probably going to be some synergies there. XAI obviously have a lot of training compute. So there may be options for Tesla to sort of license or access, lease a little bit of access for training. But at this point in time, it's hard to know exactly sort of where the overlap begins and ends, but Musk has floated the idea of Tesla, the company investing in XAI. And I would be a massive fan of that. 
And I think anyone that's got a, um, a functioning brain would probably be of the same mindset because the alternative is to keep cash just sitting around and being eroded due to inflation. Tesla's got like 30 plus billion dollars of cash and in investments. Yeah. Most of that is literally in cash. So they got more money than they know what to do with despite investing aggressively. So yeah. I suspect what's probably going to happen is that there'll be a proposal to Tesla shareholders should Tesla invest $5 billion or so into XAI. Don't know if investors will approve that. I certainly would. And I think yeah. that's probably then going to create a situation where the two companies can scratch each other's back in a mutually beneficial relationship because now there's an ownership where Tesla actually owns a portion of XAI. So what's going to be worth more, do you think? Would it be full self-driving robo-taxis or Tesla bot? What brings in more revenue? Over the long term, it'll be the bot for sure. Yeah. It's not even close. Yeah, the, the bot's going to just dwarf autonomy by, yeah. I mean, see, autonomy is a subset of useful labor. I mean, you've got drivers today, chauffeurs, yeah. et cetera, versus all labor, which is what the bot's going after. And I think it will take time to play out, but you just have to look at world GDP over time. What happens when labor... Yep. Yeah. Plus technology have a little bit of time to percolate together. You just have astronomical GDP growth. And so humanoid robot at scale, if it's increasingly intelligent and capable over time, is just going to scale up the amount of useful labor globally. And it's not just physical labor. I think a lot of people think, well, robot, what can it do in a factory? But mm. it's going to become increasingly intelligent over time too. Yeah, It's going to put you and I out of a job. I agree. I've said that on yeah. the channel as well. I agree. hundred percent. The question is when and you know how, how can we invest in the companies that will put us out of a job? That's what I yeah. think. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's kind of weird because I think it. my most likely outcome is that money's going to become completely meaningless a few decades from now, but I'm acting like it's not. I'm you think so? I'm acting like it's not. Yeah, I do. I think we're going to enter an era of hyperabundance where money yeah. loses all meaning. The cost of goods falls to essentially zero. Yeah. yeah. And we have- marginal, Would you say marginal cost it would be the- yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, there's still going yeah. to be some underlying cost in terms of energy and materials, but the marginal cost of everything is going to fall to close to zero. Yeah, And a good example of that historically is what's happened with data at the moment. What we're doing right now is costing us approximately nothing. I mean, there's a slight cost there in terms of having internet access and energy. But yeah. to do what we're doing now, 30 years ago, would have cost many tens of millions of dollars to have all of the equipment just to broadcast to an audience like this, right? And so that same kind of cost decline to almost zero is going to happen across the board to goods and services, but it will take time. True, it wasn't even possible either, was it? So your your analogy is spot on. I, I wow, I was just thinking how what you're saying about abundance. I've been saying that as well. I haven't used the word hyperabundance, but I've obviously the question is what will that abundance be? What will it look like? How much will it be? My my brain is just sort of fried thinking about that. But um, yeah, how do you imagine this future? We have, I mean, we have no idea. Obviously, Elon Musk thinks it could go bad artificial intelligence. I don't actually think that's likely. I think it's possible, but I think it's more likely we see this, what you're saying is hyperabundance. And the question is, um, I think what you're saying as well is interesting, how investors are now saying they have to take advantage of it now. They have only a short window. Um, a lot of you know wealthy investors are saying we've got maybe 10 years before we see this, even less potentially, before this hyperabundance begins. And GDP, like you said, is going to skyrocket. I just, my brain's sort of thinking, how is that going to change? What, what's going to happen? What, what What's the world going to look like? It's mm. intriguing to think about. What do you think? How, how, do, you think, how do you think that will affect um, global GDP um, number, what numbers wise? Would you say sometimes I, I throw around things like 10x, but I have no idea. Just really. Well, it depends how long the time frame. I mean, long enough time frame, we're going to be talking multiple, multiple orders of magnitude, mm. but it's just how long does that take? You know, I think historically, if you go look at world GDP over time, it's sort of tracked over about the last 2,000 years online. You can see the multiple order of magnitude increases just over that time frame. And people, I don't think, really grasp that this trend is continuing and it's exponential. You have this compounding effect and an acceleration in terms of productivity. We've seen a huge, over, over just the last couple of decades with the internet sort of coming out of nowhere and technology, we have a huge compounding. Again, the example of what you and I are doing right now, we're earning a living mm. doing something that was unfathomable previously with mm. very little overhead. And this is just one of the many examples of what technology can enable. There's so many things that we can't even imagine or envision that technology is going to make possible. And it just gets it gets too crazy to 
to sort of put an upper limit on what could happen with GDP. I, yeah. I've got no idea. Yeah. But I don't see any reason, and I, I'm not that creative, but I don't see any reasonable limitation to world productivity over time. Like I don't, I don't see any evidence to suggest there's some magic ceiling where suddenly, oh, well, we can't produce any more or be more useful, add more value. People won't want more goods. They won't want to be improved. You know, if we could start talking about even just human longevity and having a nanobot for mm. every cell in the body, and you, there's, it can keep going and going and going to a point where I don't see any reasonable limitations for GDP. And that's where I think when we enter this era of hyperabundance, money really will lose all meaning. What's Everything's going to be essentially free. But I'm still, like I said, I'm not acting as though that's going to be the case. I still rather set myself up financially, but yeah, I think that is an inevitable outcome. Yeah, yeah. Imagine, right, that Elon Musk dies. Like Steve Jobs obviously was the driving force behind Apple. Obviously, Elon Musk is the same for Tesla. Imagine he dies. Could that affect Tesla stock? And if so, would you recommend who would be the backup? Like who's your... Now, you're all in, but let's say that did happen. Who's the backup company that you invest in that you think, you know, is going to have some sort of, you know, large potential over the next decade? It's a good question. I think that inevitably if Elon Musk did die, and hopefully that doesn't happen for a while, but you never know, especially he's making a lot of enemies at the moment. That's right. <laughs> saying, saying things that are true and, and pointing out facts and standing up to bullies. But yeah, I think that there would definitely be a knee-jerk reaction on Tesla stock. This is inevitable. Human psychology people just freak the puck out. The question is, you know, how much of a longer term impact would that have had? Certainly it's better to have Musk at the helm than not. But in terms of other companies out there, there's nothing that I have a strong enough conviction to to put out there at this point in time. Yeah, that's not to say there's not, not other opportunities, but I've never considered myself an investor. I, I just occasionally I'll see an opportunity. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll pursue that. Mm. So I'm not thinking, of, I don't have a backup list of all these XYZ companies that I'd invest in otherwise. And I personally think that Tesla has enough momentum and enough leadership with their technology now that they will be successful in autonomy and with humanoid robots, with or without Musk. Musk at the helm, it's probably faster success and larger overall success. But I don't think that Musk no longer being there is going to change. Like I've, I've said in a lot of my videos, Tesla has effectively solved most of the brain necessary for a useful humanoid robot in their vehicle. Mm. And no other company has the data to solve that problem, period. And it's not just that no other company has that data, but in order for another company to actually acquire the data, they would literally need to deploy the better part of a trillion dollars of hardware on roads instantaneously to start collecting data at a comparable rate to Tesla just to train. That ain't happening. So even if Musk is not in the picture, Tesla has this this asset that no other company, unless Tesla licenses this to other companies, is going to have. So I would still probably just retain Tesla stock. And certainly if there was another opportunity out there and identify it, then I'm happy to I'm not I'm not like focused on being all in on Tesla just for its own sake. If there's an opportunity out there, I'm happy to pursue it. But I don't see that as a as a situation where if Musk is out of the picture, suddenly, oh no, the story's over for Tesla. I've got to go invest in something else. You were, invest, you were invested in Google and Amazon, right? Before? Yeah. Yep. And you obviously decided you sold those. So what, what made you decide to sell? Oh, when I first began investing in stocks, I always had a threshold of 75 to 80% Tesla at a minimum, but there was still a risk of the company failing. So I, I weighed up my options. I'm like, well, if they go to zero, that's fine. I'll still have some stocks. It'll be okay. And Amazon and Google are fairly self-explanatory. They had dominant positions in their field. They're very, very profitable companies at scale, huge data advantages. It's hard to, you know, mm. take down Google. That being said, with what's happening with LLMs now, search could be in more trouble than I would ever have imagined possible back in the day. But these companies, I produced a pretty decent return on the investment over a few years. And at that point in time, toward 2019, Tesla stock crashes $12 or so per share, split adjusted. I'd made plenty of a return on Google, Amazon, and a few other stocks as well. It just made sense to get out of those completely and load up on Tesla. I mean, yeah. again, I'm going to just repeat this. In 2019, in May, Tesla stock was about $12 per share, split adjusted. And I'm going to dig this clip up a few years from now <laughs> just to emphasize even more because at yeah. $200 or so dollars now, people are going to look back and go, wait, what? It was that? So mm -hmm. it just didn't make any sense to hold these. Tesla had gone past, got through production hell. Everyone, the narrative was they're going bankrupt. That never made sense. So, and just to go back to the earlier point, the reason that I was investing most, but not all of my capital in Tesla initially was there was a risk of failure. 
I scattered my cash around a bunch of other companies, predominantly Google and Amazon, but there was a few others prior to that as well, about 14 or 15. And in all but one of those cases, I made two, three times my money over a few years. I mean, it wasn't rocket science, companies with a lot of growth potential. Yeah. And so the overall philosophy and strategy over the long term was always to sprinkle my cash around a little bit, mostly in Tesla. And then assuming Tesla doesn't go bust, these companies on average have probably gone up and I can then sell that and pile into Tesla. So yeah. it was always a all in on Tesla long term plan, but I just needed to make sure they get through production hell. So the entire portfolio didn't blow up and go to zero. So yeah, it was just, well, at this point in time now, I'm going to do what I plan on doing, which was get out of those other stocks and load up on Tesla. If Elon Musk used Neuralink to merge himself with AI, would he have godlike powers? Would he be a genius level person who, I, I, to be fair, I do think, I do think if we're objective, there is a bit of a monopoly like you already mentioned it yourself, the data, they have the data. Hmm. They have, I think it's an advantage. It's the media have disparaged Tesla so much that people don't realize all these things you're pointing out. Mm-hmm. So they already have a bit of a monopoly. Then Musk owns uh, SpaceX, which has a clear monopoly in internet and, you know, not just, not just home internet, but now moving into cellular internet. He owns mm-hmm. a bit of everything. If he was to merge with AI, is that, does that give him the, you know, the president of America has a certain level of power, but that's his whole different level, right? How, how do Who that is play? the president of America? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> but but ultimately, if Musk, like, like users, he has this ability, right, to potentially merge with, use, use Neuralink to merge mm-hmm. himself with AI. Could that give him that? How would that play out? Well, uh, things that get pretty wild. I think Musk probably already has more influence and power than any president in the world at the moment. Yeah. Uh, this is obvious. He's doing things in the real world. The president of the United States is just a puppet for the machine anyway, at least at the moment. Um, I think it's pretty obvious to anyone that's got a brain and has been watching over the last four years that, you know, someone's there, the lights are on, but no one's home. So I think in terms of real world impact, you know, Musk is already having a far bigger impact globally, not just in terms of product and technology disrupting industries, but also in global conversation, enabling people to, to freely share their thoughts and their opinions and ideas. Mm. I mean, if he hadn't acquired X, uh, I don't even want to imagine what that would be like. But certainly supplementing his abilities with Neuralink and augmenting his intelligence certainly wouldn't be a bad thing. But I think everyone's going to have that opportunity at some point. I don't know when exactly. Uh, Ray Kurzweil's got many thoughts on this. He and does, yeah. I think this is part of that sort of era of hyperabundance and where things just get completely wild. If you imagine humans being able to suddenly almost overnight, you know, become a million times more intelligent and capable mm. and increase our speed of thought and our memory, our cognition, uh, it's going to get pretty wild. And this is the point where it's just hard to predict what does the future look like? What does anything even mean anymore? What is, what is it existing at that point in time? I like just, you know, hard to know. So you don't, do you see, do you think Musk would plan to potentially do that? Because the way I see it, he has this much brain power, all these companies, he's having to make all these decisions if he was to do that that potentially means he can process things much, much faster. Potentially, you know, do, you, do you see it as a strategy? Because I personally think that he's planning to do that, but I, may, I may, maybe I'm crazy. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that if the technology is there. Yeah. I mean, Musk, it's quite obvious to me, and I think anyone that pays close attention, Elon Musk is trying to be useful. He's trying to maximize his utility to humanity. Yeah. That's what he's trying to do, to be yeah. useful. So if you're ever unsure, what would he do? Will this help him be more useful? If the answer is yes, well, duh, he's going to do it. So, yeah, it seems pretty obvious. Do you agree with all the stuff he tweets? Do you think that? Well, I don't agree with everything, but I do agree yeah. with the idea and principle that he should be sharing his opinions and not be a fucking bitch. Do you think There's it's... people telling him to stop saying this and don't have an opinion and that's divisive? Fuck you. Let the men speak. He's a human. Just because you're a pussy and you're too scared to put your ideas out there because you, well, you might offend somebody doesn't mean you should impose your pussiness on someone else. That That's my thoughts. You're clearly um, similar to him. You don't. You don't really care. Yeah. What you think no fucks given. Yeah, yeah. and I, I can't. I cannot. Like psychologically, I just can't put myself in the shoes of somebody who's unwilling. If somebody mm. has an important belief, something they feel strongly about, and they believe it's important, and they're unwilling to say or share that, put it out there, mm. I cannot understand. I can't put myself in those shoes. I like. I can't. I cannot imagine what it's like to be a human vagina and just not be able to do that. I just. I just can't. And and that's just. It's very hard for me to empathize with people that 
even try to, to suggest don't share that opinion and don't say that and it's too contra I don't I just can't put myself in those shoes. I'm just not built that way. It's just not how I'm wired. So do, do people posting negative comments based on you being totally honest, does that ever bother you? Not particularly. I mean, I think most of the time there's a subset of people that will have criticism that's valid. You know, it, and I totally I take that on board, you know, it's useful. But then there's also a number of confused admirers, also known as haters, who have notifications on and they're desperate to just, you know, say something negative every yeah. time. And I just, my immediate reaction there is just empathy. I feel bad for these people. It's it's legitimately like a 42-year-old yeah. man living in his parents' basement who's just angry at life because he's got nowhere. And he's just, hate always comes from below. It never comes from above. And I just feel bad for these people. I'm like, to be in such a situation psychologically where you're expending energy and time trying to bring somebody down, I'm the wrong target, bro. I, uh, like it's water off a duck's back for me. You got to pick somebody that like has some issues with their confidence or their self-image. I'm not the guy. I'm just sitting here laughing, thinking, please, what are you doing with your life? You could be reading some books from Jim Rohn and try and learn how to get yeah. better and stop. Yeah. And instead you're just sitting here attacking. So I don't particularly get bothered by that. I've never been somebody who's been at all concerned about other people's opinions, including about me. And I think that might be an autism thing or it might just be a me thing, but I, I just don't care. And so it doesn't particularly bother me, but I do, I do read all the comments and feedback. And a few days ago, what was it? Two days ago, my, my eight year old, he said, dad, your shorts keep popping up in my feed. And, um, he said, oh, I, and I've been watching them, but I've seen that people making your haters are making these negative comments. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it does seem to affect a lot of people in a negative way. And the thing is human psychology for most people, a negative comment is going to sting like, you know, 10, 20, 30 times more than a positive comment. Posit yeah. You know, yeah. you see dozens of people saying, this is amazing. I love your channel. You inspired me, whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Then you have a one negative comment. I think most people it really affects, but the mindset shift for me, I just, I see a hater and it's either valid. I'm taken on board or I just feel bad. It's empathy. I mean, like it's another one of these basement dollars, man, I'm like, you know, like go read a Jim Rohn book. Like stop, stop spitting this hate at somebody <laughs> yeah you know and I, like i yeah. said i think most haters general like act, proactive haters are not just the one up you're a dickhead fuck you i'm never watching you again mm. most proactive haters and you're, they're like flies on shit they just can't they're actually just confused admirers they see traits in you that they wish was in themselves but they can't accept this and mm. so they just try and bring you down what what other explanation can you have from somebody who's got notifications on across all of your social media and they're like the first person to comment every yeah. fucking time? And by the way, this will be funny. When you post videos of me on your channel, read the comments, you will see the haters who have been looking for me or find my shit everywhere. I put this guy, I hate this guy, I can't believe you invited him on your channel. He's a... yeah. and the, I'm like, what are you doing, bro? Why don't you even click on the video? Because they're well, actually secretly admiring. They're just confused. Before, before I forget, I should mention the fact that you're a significant part of the reason I started the channel. I was watching Peter Diamandis and some Tony Sieber stuff, mm -hmm. Singularity University, some of them doing their predictions on solar. I was thinking mm -hmm. people don't realize that actually the world is going to get much better. Everyone's thinking the world's mm -hmm. getting worse, it's getting worse, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. read a few books about um, that writer of the, of the Better Angels of Our Nature. He talked about the statistics. Oh, of uh, Kotler? No, not Kotler. Uh, Steve and Pinker. I think yeah. that's one of the books you recommended as well. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read it, so I probably did recommend it. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, wow, people think that everything's getting worse. It's not. Mm -hmm. And that along with your predictions, you really definitely drove me to do this. So, I mean, people may criticize it, but I might not be here if it hadn't been for a lot of the stuff you said. There that's you go. true. 100%. So thank you for inspiring me to do that, to, to get this, because it is... It is extremely satisfying to be able to to affect people in a positive way. And so, sometimes um, I think what's bothered me with the comments is I've had a few comments, a few pe people that consistently will post on videos, he's lying, uh, he made up the story of cancer about his wife. That, that's, that isn't true. Even though I've, I've obviously shared data from do doctors and um, I've even had an interview with a cancer mm -hmm. oncologist on the channel, that someone would say that and think that I could be hiding this from my entire family and, and mm. tricking everyone. And, and to me, that really, that even though it's insane, that was mm -hmm. painful. I've got to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can imagine. I mean, obviously it's a really personal and seriously um, challenging time you've gone through and for people to just be denying that and then to suggest that there's some ulterior motivation, it's just mental, but yeah. these, these are people who are just 
dark and nasty humans rotten to the core and they're just reflecting outward kind of traits that they know are in themselves like you'll never hear somebody say anything about you that isn't a reflection of how they feel about themselves so people who are, are willing to be dishonest and deceptive are the same people you'll hear coming up with these crazy conspiracies that you committed fraud or made this or that up it's not it's they're not saying it about you it's just a reflection of how they feel about themselves deep down and the hilarious thing is they don't realize this but no one is going to accuse you or say anything about you that they, it isn't a reflection of how they feel about themselves. You're not going to find a healthy, mentally healthy person that has a positive outlook on life that's that's randomly suggesting that you're a liar or committing fraud or deceiving people. That doesn't happen. You, they will, they're never, never, ever. You will find somebody who has a very dark, nasty, toxic, pessimistic outlook who is dishonest and deceptive and takes advantage of people who make those claims of you. It just doesn't happen the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting back to the automotive industry, do you think that um, I think BYD will pass Toyota in total and Volkswagen Group in total car sales before 2030? Do you think I'm being optimistic? Do you think that's possible? Maybe a little optimistic, but it is inevitable that Toyota's vehicle sales are going to go to approximately zero. Same with Volkswagen. So it's, at some point, BYD is going to overtake them by default. It's just a matter of when. They'll and go to I zero because they don't have full self-driving? Toyota. No, they're going to go to zero because they're basically producing horses and buggies at the moment. Toyota are just brain dead. They're, they're a bunch of fucking uh, compliant soy boys running the shop over there. I mean, they, 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 this is what happens in Toyota. Some idiot has a great idea. Let's pursue hydrogen and hybrids and all these. And he'll be, yes, sir, great idea, sir. Great, you're very smart, sir. Yes, sir, we'll do that, sir. They're all a bunch of pussies. No one's going to say that's a dumb idea. We need to change direction. That's the yeah. whole culture in Toyota is compliance and obedience to senior management. Yeah. They're, and no one's willing to say, oh, there's an iceberg there, bro. We're going to all going to die. It's just like, yes, a great idea. Volkswagen, on the other hand, it's just so bureaucratic. There's so many layers of red tape. They're never going to get anything done. And so these companies have spread themselves too thin. They're probably 10, 15 years late to the party. They're still today making public comments, especially Toyota. They're talking mm. about consumers don't really, we don't really know what they want. We can't tell them what they want. And mm. we're going to, that, that four independent forms of propulsion Toyota is still pursuing today. It's crazy mm. to see this stuff. So they're absolutely toast. It's got nothing to do with autonomy. It's just what's going to happen is their ice sales are going to collapse and now yeah. they'll have reversing economies of scale. So to produce the same vehicle will cost yeah. more, which means they need to sell it more or their margin collapses. And yeah. they're not making any money on electric vehicles. So they can't supplement their EV business with a collapsing ice business. And it's going to be a death spiral. I don't I don't think people realize how fast their demise will happen, happen either. So they, yeah. have, they both have around about 190 billion US dollars in debt. Yep. And, I mean, this, this was coming. And obviously the question is, they, like you said, they can't service that debt because their margins go down. Mm -hmm. So you say you're basically saying that they're going to go bankrupt, essentially. Yeah, effed, both of them. You knew this is yeah. coming, <laughs> both of them. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's, it's quite obvious. I mean, look, the yeah. best case scenario, maybe they limp forward into next decade and they're producing maybe at most one or two million vehicles a year each. I'll be stunned if that happens. I mean, give me an example of a disruption in an industry previously where an incumbent somehow survived. I, I, I don't know any of them, right? I, Netflix, Blockbuster, you know, Kodak versus digital cameras. I, I can't think of a single example where an incumbent survived. And I've been uh, uh, warning people quite aggressively about Toyota and Volkswagen in particular, mm. not making the right moves since the start of this YouTube channel. And they're still not making the right moves. Again, Toyota today are still out there mm, talking about how people want hydrogen. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. They're even caught people trying to force them to buy back their hydrogen cars, which are almost inoperable. Yeah. I yeah. I, th I think that the hydrogen stuff is Toyota trying to appease the Japanese government in part. There seems to have been a lot of a push uh, from the Japanese government. Mm. For hydrogen because they invested in into, the, into the hydrogen? I believe so. Yeah. And I think that Toyota is like a bunch of pussies again. Like, uh, oh, okay, let's, let's please the government or just the hydrogen. Idiots. Right. There's just there's there's no leadership there at all. It's just incredible to see. I mean, VW, at least Herbert Deese before he was yeah. <laughs> fired, at least was saying the right stuff. He recognized what needed to happen and was doing his best. But it's pretty hard when you're playing in a company that's so bureaucratic and there's so much there's too many people and too many decision makers <clears> there, <throat> too many interests. But the Toyota are a whole other level of, of screwed though. So they just no idea. My concern is I think the entire Japanese automotive industry is in crisis. They didn't realize that it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be bad for the economy there when it blows up real bad. How does that affect us? Do I, I actually think this could be a little bit like 2008 where the ramifications, the flow on effects globally 
could be enormous. I mean, obviously, Japan has more debt than any economy in the history of mankind, but not just more. It's more by mm. orders of magnitude. It's more than double mm. anyone else. And then their entire automotive industry is, they're more dependent on one sector than any other country in the world. Yeah. When that sector goes, what happens to Japan's economy? Yeah, I think there's going to be yeah. a huge... Yeah. Don't forget the aging population as well. Aging. Yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it's going to be very bad. Do you think, very. do you agree with me that that could have a flow on effect globally? Could be some sort of, well, it will have some, stock crash, I don't know exactly how much the magnitude. I can't really tell. I don't know in terms yeah. of total GDP of Japan versus the world, how big of a deal it could be, but yeah. it's certainly not going to be insignificant. The whole automotive industry is going to implode. That's going to leave a huge hole in the economy and yeah, not going to be pretty. When you say implode, I mean, I see the automotive industry contracting significantly. What would you say? How do you see that playing out? Yeah, I complete, completely agree. Massive contraction. Yeah. And the thing is, the problem with an automotive company is if you're at a certain scale and you have rates within margins in the auto industry, <clears> you can't <throat> afford to decline because yeah. you have disproportionately high costs, fixed costs that stay. They're carrying a shitload of debt as well. You can't just sort of slowly scale down a little bit. It's going to be this catastrophic. If they can't service debt, or they suddenly start losing a few billion dollars a quarter instead of making a couple of, like, what then? Yeah. And th there's no magic button you can press to solve the problem. You have to scale up EV production profitably or some other product profitably. Yeah. And you're competing with Tesla, by the way, and BYD and some other Chinese companies as well. Yeah. Good luck. Chinese companies, which ones do you think are the best? Like top three? Um, well, I haven't driven any Chinese EV, so I can't speak from personal experience. Uh, I think BYD are doing well, but it's embarrassing how many vehicle models they have to be comparable to Tesla in total revenue. I don't think that they have a great sustainable business strategy. I think they'll probably be okay, but it's a shit business. They have paper thin margins. They got in in China alone. I think they had for them to do roughly the same amount of revenue in China as Tesla did. Tesla's got two models: the Y and the three in China, doing all the heavy lifting. BYD had like eighteen or nineteen different models for approximately the same revenue selling those vehicles for half or a third the cost of a Tesla. That's not good. The fact that a company can be selling just two products for two or three times the cost of your average vehicle, home country, and matching your revenue with a lack of complexity, two vehicles versus 18 or so for BYD. You've got to think about the supply chain, the parts, all the things that create complexity and the lower economies of scale because there's less parts in common, less processes in common. There's so much variety. So BYD is doing great in terms of total volume but I don't like their business strategy at all. Imagine if Apple had like 27 different models of iPhone. Yeah, like, there's too many I mean, models. What are you doing? There's I've said that many complexity times. complexity in the business. Way too much. Like, like BYD could be doing so well if they just tried to nail one vehicle in each category yeah. at a low yeah. price point. They would yeah. kill it. And from a business point of view, not only could they make a better product for consumers, but they'd benefit more from being able to order parts in bulk and have yeah. lower costs. But instead, they've got like, the, we'll just do everything at once strategy. What is energy division? It's a good idea. That may in fact be one of their saving graces. Mm. I think probably, I think for in order for an, an electric vehicle company over the long term to really have a strong chance, I think they need simplicity in their products in terms of vehicles. And they also should have an mm. energy business where they're producing batteries and probably storage products as well. There's a lot of overlap there. Mm. And I think Tesla's sort of explicitly mentioned this on some of their earnings call. If they have surplus batteries for their vehicles, then they can go into energy products. And the wait list for Tesla's storage products at the moment, absolutely enormous. Yeah. It makes sense if you're a company, BYD in particular, making batteries as well, definitely having an energy business. And that, that's a huge, so the thing with the automotive industry is very cyclical, a little sentiment driven, interest rate driven. These energy storage products in particular are no brainers for businesses. If your mm. job at a business is to save a lot of money and you look at the cost of having a ba big battery or multiple batteries yep. versus what you're doing now, you can save yourself millions of dollars. You yep. know, you're going to get a nice little attaboy for saving all this from your boss. It's like, it's an absolute no brainer. And so even during tough economic times, if you've got storage products as well, and importantly, if you're producing batteries, you can sell to other companies. That's a great business. But yeah, I'm not a big fan of BYD's uh, automotive strategy at the moment. There's way too much complexity and way too many products. It is complex. I agree with that. They're obviously doing very well with the other side of the business, the energy division, as is Tesla. Do you think Tesla's energy, energy division will continue seeing the kind of growth it's seen? I think it's going to actually increase their growth mm -hmm. in energy. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, they're still starting from a pretty low base. And yep. yeah, I think at some point 
you know, depending on how long interest rates remain at these kind of levels, it's possible that Tesla's energy business could overtake their automotive, just the hardware sales in terms of profitability. Yeah. I'm not predicting this will happen. I think probably interest rates come down a bit and the automotive industry gets back to normal, but you never know. My point there though, they have a wait list, give or take a couple of years for these energy storage products. And as I said, they are no brainers. Every business on earth that's at a certain scale, even just for their own needs, is going to want a big ass battery. And yeah. all of the the utilities and energy providers globally, it's also a no-brainer to have these batteries. They print money versus – and the thing is, I'm sure you'll be aware from Tony Sieber's work, we already mm. produce a massive surplus of energy. We have yeah. production capacity far <clears throat> in excess of, of the highest need because we need to suit peak demand. And a lot of people don't realize the rest of the time, if you're not storing the energy that's being produced, it just it's, it's a waste. Yeah. And a lot of the time we're not running production as high as we need because – What's the point of overproducing energy? But if you can store that, it's just such a huge opportunity. So I think there's going to be insane growth. I mean, as fast as you can make these energy storage products, people will buy them for years to come. And they're massive. I mean, some of these things are multiple millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, 100 plus million dollar orders for big batteries. Even into the billions, some of these mega batteries. Yeah. Here in Australia, people are saying we have this, we have too much solar. That's what some of the press is saying. But I, I see it. I see Australia becoming like California within a short period of time, where all of a sudden we have too much solar, and I have I'm overproducing massively on yep. my solar, and all yep. of a sudden we store that solar, and then California yep. six to ten p.m. number one yep. source of energy is batteries, yep. and it's like free energy, like you said. And I think Tony Sieber mentions two hundred percent. We need to build two hundred percent. I don't know if that people agree with that, but that's what he mm -hmm. says, which then makes us a superpower. We have one hundred percent excess energy ninety eight mm -hmm. percent of the time. Mm -hmm. What do we do with all that extra energy? Mm -hmm. What do we do with it? What's the best use of all that extra energy? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've thought about this needs. so many times. What we, what do we do with all this extra? And obviously, governments are saying, well, "Well, we just turned it into hydrogen. That's their solution." What are your thoughts on that? I think we'll probably find better uses than than producing hydrogen for the excess energy. <laughs> Personally, um, as I've mentioned earlier, we, we're probably going to enter an era of hyper abundance as a yeah. species, and I think our needs for energy are actually going to increase dramatically. They're not going to be needs in terms of it's essential to get by. We're kind of at that point already. We're, we're meeting our needs. Yeah. But if there's a point where we have just an absolute surplus of energy, we will find ways to use that. And I don't think it's going to be producing hydrogen. Although in fairness, at some point over the long term, there will be a use case when you have so much energy, you don't know what to do with it. You can produce hydrogen, which is extremely energy inefficient in terms of the it production is. process. Because there will be some use cases, gigantic ships at sea and maybe some planes where it may make sense. But I think we're probably going to find a lot better uses for surplus energy than hydrogen production. On the what's, the new, what's the new cheap EV? What do you mean? From Tesla. What's it? What, what is it going well, to be? You know, probably... They're saying two models, right, in next year? So well, I don't soon. know if they've specifically said how many models. There's sort of rumors and hearsay. Sure. But I personally expect that the robo taxi, dedicated robo taxi, unveiled uh, less than a month from now. There's going to be a vehicle platform. That's the modular manufacturing system, the unboxed right. system. Yeah. And I think Tesla's going to develop a sedan and a compact SUV on that same platform. Maybe a few variations, especially for compact SUV globally. And they're probably going to be able to produce those things over long term for about 18, 19 grand. Sell them for around 25, decent profit. Um, but I think Tesla's in a transitional period where they may be starting to focus more on robot taxis and miles disrupted as opposed yeah. to vehicles sold to consumers. So yeah. honestly, if Tesla said, oh, fuck it, we changed our mind about the cheaper vehicle, we're just going to pump robot taxis like crazy and crank them out everywhere, I'd be totally fine with that. Um, but, but Tesla yeah. are saying that they're going to produce these cheap new, cheaper new vehicles soon, within months, oh, the intro on the same production lines. About. On the yeah. same production yeah. Uh, do you, I my my guess is that it's the same car just stripped down. Yeah, that's my expectation too. I didn't realize that's what you meant. Yeah, the the interim yeah. vehicles I think before the next gen vehicle with a much lower cost. I think yeah. that they're going to be the three and the Y, but implementing the modular manufacturing systems at least in part from what they've sort of developed for the next gen vehicle to reduce the cost of producing those vehicles. Of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, Model Three and Model Y are already killer products, and if they can implement cost savings at drive the cost down 10, 15, 20% yeah. on those. Like it will be a no-brainer not to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. For Tesla, I see Tesla moving away, like you just said, away from selling large numbers of cars because um, clearly it's a zero-sum game, right? We already established that. I think that's very clear. The automotive industry realizes the automotive industry is going to shrink. They don't realize how fast, but like you've said, mm -hmm. very fast. 
does it even make sense for Tesla to not even focus on vehicle deliveries and focus more of their investment into artificial intelligence, into full self-driving, into the Tesla bot, if that's going to represent 90% of their, potentially even more than that, of their overall, you know, Tesla's not going to 10X based on car sales, obviously, or energy division, obviously. Is it really then um, they should be focusing, going even more all in on full self-driving and the Tesla bot? Well, I think the bot, obviously, long term, it's as I've said in the past, Tesla bot in the future, the profits, the revenue will make Tesla's entire business, including autonomy, look like a rounding error. Yeah. That's not hyperbole. I mean that. It's literally going to look like a rounding error. We're going to look back and go, Jesus Christ, he wasn't joking. But <laughs> in terms of autonomy, I think Tesla's focus is already, even though they're not saying it publicly, is disrupting ice miles with EV miles. That's how I think about this. So, because yeah. it's in line with their mission, they want to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And the way to do that, the best ROI on that is putting robo-taxis on roads because they have higher utilization than personally owned vehicles. Yeah. And so I think Tesla's focus is already completely and utterly on autonomy and the robo-taxi fleet. And that's that's probably how they're measuring things is how many miles are being driven globally in electric vehicles, whether it's Tesla or otherwise, doesn't matter. Most of them will probably be Tesla though. So consumer-facing vehicles, they're going to probably keep selling these for years to come, but it's just going to be a sideshow relative to autonomy, in my opinion. I think Tesla's goal really is to scale their robotaxi fleet as fast as possible with dedicated yep. vehicles that are extremely energy efficient, extremely low maintenance. And the thing is, a lot of people don't realize you don't need that many vehicles to completely disrupt something like Uber. If you guys are curious for a little bit of homework, go and even say the numbers, but do some digging and learn how many Uber vehicles are operating, say, in the United States or globally. Mm. And look at how many Tesla vehicles are already on roads and you, you might be surprised. Are you saying that full self-driving could actually work in the existing Tesla vehicles? Well, that's inevitable as well. And I'm not some saying people that's think the that only way that it will, but some, it, some people are saying that full self-driving won't work in hardware three capable vehicles. Yeah, they got no idea. Do you think it will? These these people are on hardware zero point five brains, and they're still able to think, but not completely. This is it's obvious that it will work. It's a software problem. Now, to be yeah. fair, more compute means you're going to have slightly higher capability. Yeah, but. It's not, it's not a matter of, oh, there's no threshold where it's suddenly not going to work. The thing is, once Tesla solves autonomy with their latest hardware, this software is going to become increasingly more efficient yeah. and require less compute over time. This is how things work. It's like as a human, if you're trying to learn a new task, initially you need all of your concentration and effort. Like trying to, let's say, drive in a car. Most people watching this probably have learned to drive a car. And at first you need to concentrate like crazy. Otherwise you're going to crash, stall the car or whatever. But once you've got this down pat, you become much more official. Your neural network becomes much more efficient at doing the task and you no longer need to pay so much attention. So to be clear, it will work first and better in the latest versions of hardware, but it's not going to stop. It's going to become more efficient and sort of flow down to the older versions of the hardware as well. And even in the worst case scenario, not, this is not necessary, but Tesla could easily do a hardware replacement on previous vehicles if they needed to, but I don't think this will be necessary. It's just a software problem. The hardware is not the issue. It's the software. Four or five years ago, somebody leaves Tesla, steals Tesla's full self-driving source code, goes to China, mm -hmm. starts working for Xpeng. Mm -hmm. Xpeng I now have a full self-driving system similar to Tesla. Mm -hmm. Many experts say it's nearly as good as Tesla. Don't know if that's true. <laughs> Expert is a pejorative term in this context. <laughs> well, Analysts in China. Yeah. Yeah. I can't personally say I haven't tested it in China. Mm -hmm. The Volkswagen Group basically get rid of their artificial intelligence division, which was in that company. Remember that company, the joint venture with Ford? Get rid mm -hmm. of it. Loses them billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Invest into Xpeng. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's for the software? Because they could potentially also, maybe they're in second place behind Tesla for full self-driving, potentially. I'm not sure what the reasoning is there. Honestly, I, I can't mm. put myself in the heads of these legacy auto companies. But I can say unquestionably and with a high level of confidence, if these companies want to survive, whether it's a legacy auto company or even one of the Chinese EV companies, they should already have agreed to license Tesla's FSD and preparing the next generations of vehicle to have the right cameras and Tesla computers inside them to operate that software. Tesla has the data advantage. So even if you argue, and I, I don't think this is correct. I mean, I haven't been an Xpeng vehicle, but I've seen enough video of the capabilities yeah. and all the lack thereof that the cool stuff, I don't think it's quite as capable as a Tesla vehicle. No one's catching up to Tesla in terms of the data and you need the data for the capabilities. 
I think if these companies have any sense, they'll end up licensing FSD from Tesla and they'll already have had preliminary discussions. There's no point as an automotive company trying to do the impossible and solve this real world AI challenge mm. when it's existential just surviving in the auto industry. You don't want to be pursuing something you're likely to fail at at scale when it's already a matter of life and death if you can produce your vehicles profitably at scale. Um, so they're, I, wasting I their, they're wasting their money investing in 100%. their own kind of um, 100%. low level. Yeah. What's the point? Did you see Mercedes Benz, the video um, where it was a 22, I think it was, no, it was either 18, 18 minute video and a Tesla was driving along a road in California. Was this the comparison? Yeah, I saw it. The comparison and then the Mercedes between, Benz yeah. had to yep. follow the Tesla. Yep. And it had yep. like 20, yep. No, it was 44 interventions in 18 minutes, 44. Mm. Mm -hmm. And people say that Mercedes-Benz has level three for self-driving. Mm -hmm. How is that? Like how are, even Consumer Reports, they're saying Mercedes-Benz for self-driving is better. Why, Con job why they... reports. Sorry, cons you more reports. Wait, what are they? Con job distorts? I forget what they're called. I think you mispronounced that that fraudulent yeah. company that used but to much be of the media is, and I'm Much of the media is saying this about Mercedes-Benz for self-driving technology. Why? I Hey, geez, uh, how much does that? Mercedes Benz spend advertising in the media? The end. They're they're yeah. they're they're stupid people, and or they know who butters their bread, and I think it's the latter. Okay. Uh, and the other thing too, people get confused about this L one, L two, L. Who gives a shit, bro? Just look at what the capabilities are. Watch people using this software. This level, this and that, is a stupid way of classifying autonomy because. Let's say that Tesla tomorrow went knocking on somebody's door, a regulator, and said, can we get approval for robo taxis in this tiny pocket in California? They get approval in a couple of blocks. Oh, so where'd that come from? Level four, five? Whoa. I didn't... You idiots. It's the same software, but now there's a new terminology and it's been classified differently. It's a silly way to think about autonomy in terms of level this. Just look at what it's doing. That's all you need to know. If you're seeing intervention-free drives from a Tesla vehicle in California... Mm. Show me another company that's doing that same drive, like you're talking about the comparison with the Mercedes, yeah. and just compare what are they capable of doing. That's all you need to know in terms of who's who's further ahead in terms of the capabilities. You don't need to be reliant upon these classifications. A lot of people, well, this particular company got approval for this software on these roads that they've pre-mapped, and this suddenly they're ahead of Tesla. That's the wrong way to think about it. Just watch mm. the vehicle drive the same stretch of road in different conditions versus something else and just compare apples to apples as opposed to letting somebody tell you, oh, this is L3, therefore it's ahead of this vehicle because they haven't asked for approval here yet. Silly. Do, do you think that being all in on Tesla, there is a little bit of an inherent bias for you in analyzing other companies versus Tesla potentially? No. I mean, the haters will say, oh, that's what somebody bias would say. But I am a hyper-rational person. People, because I, I sound so hyperbolic, and because Tesla is in such a dominant lead, I sound completely deluded. Like I, I acknowledge the, the perception, right? You look at me and go, this guy's all in on Tesla. Of course he's biased. There's a reason I'm all in on Tesla. And it's not because I'm biased, because my brain's working and I continually look at what's happening with Tesla versus the rest of the landscape. I think about this stuff. I, I talk about this company 24-7. I think about this company 24-7. But I'm not just living in a bubble where I only want to hear what is Tesla doing. I'm looking at everything else happening in the landscape. This is why I'm able to talk about some of the so-called competition. I've seen that Mercedes video. Why did I watch that? Because I want to see what are these companies doing, right? I'm not living in a bubble and deluding myself. I'm all in Tesla, therefore I can't take on new information. I'm watching this and go, okay. See, Lucid, for example, are a great example. They're doing some incredible engineering, specifically mm. for bragging rights. They're producing electric motors that are more efficient per kilowatt hour in terms of the battery pack than Tesla. I'm aware of this. Mm. But my question then is, who cares, bro? How are you going to scale to volume production? It doesn't matter if you've got the fastest vehicle, the quickest zero to 60 time. That yeah. doesn't matter. Are you going to stay in business? So I'm constantly looking at the landscape. And the longer I look, the further Tesla is pulling ahead. I've said in the past, most of these legacy automotive companies are not going to be in business a decade from now. And I stand by that. Nothing's changed here. In fact, it's gotten even worse. I would have thought some of these companies would have started to panic and say, okay, we're going all in on EVs. Not the case. I've gone in great detail through my thesis around autonomy. In order for somebody to catch Tesla, they need the data. In order to get the data, they need to put about a trillion dollars of hardware on roads. And so you ask the question, how would somebody catch up to Tesla in terms of autonomy? They literally need the data. So how would they get the data? I thought about all of these things in great detail. Um, it's inevitable. Tesla's won electric vehicles, but that's last decade's news. They won autonomy. There will be other companies that operate robot taxis, but generalized autonomy at scale. It's a one-horse race, pun intended, at the moment. 
And in terms of the humanoid robot, I can't call that yet, but they appear to be in a position that I would be envious of if I were any other company because they've transplanted the brain from the vehicle. So I sound deluded only because Tesla is in such a dominant position, in my opinion. Now, I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe that I'm I'm biased. That I'm not I'm not biased toward Tesla because I'm all in on Tesla. I'm all in on Tesla because I'm not biased toward Tesla. If that makes sense, I'm I'm looking out into the landscape. I'm bro, holy shit! They really are this far ahead on everything that matters. I'd love somebody to be able to make a strong thesis as to why any company could overtake Tesla in terms of EVs at scale. Tesla's going to make the lion's share of profits, in my opinion, on electric vehicles. Same with autonomy. I'd love to hear a thesis from somebody. And not, oh, an expert made a list and says that Tesla's behind. And I'd love to hear a thesis, how does somebody actually overtake Tesla? I've yet to hear a convincing thesis on this. Of well, course, humanoid robots, the only maybe. Yeah. When you say it could overtake Tesla, I mean, potentially, Tesla does have a bit of a disadvantage because it makes cars outside of China. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's their margins will be lower, of course, than yes. their margins on Shanghai Chinese-made vehicles are obviously the highest Correct. vehicles they make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you would think that some of their Chinese rivals, if they're producing only in China, potentially have the opportunity to, I mean, there are disadvantages, of course, they can't enter the US market or Canada, Yes. Mm -hmm. but the advantage is just having that lower cost um, efficiency, mm -hmm. having them, all the vehicles built in one country is logistically simpler. Mm -hmm. Not to say that's BOD, I mean, BOD have factories all over the world now. Mm -hmm. Do you see any, I mean, you said that you see other robotaxi companies existing, but do you see any other companies um, rivaling Tesla coming second, third? Who would you say is the most promising? No one's on the radar at the moment. Cruiser and Waymo are fucked. They've produced a really brittle. Cruiser and Waymo? On, yep. They've got yeah. a very brittle solution. Don't don't get me wrong. They are operating services. Well, <laughs> Cruise maybe not so much at the moment. No. Um, yeah. But Waymo have a service already operating. But they don't have a generalized autonomous software. They can't generalize this and scale widely. They are dependent on pre-mapping everything in high definition with LiDAR. Yeah. But people don't understand. They're literally sending around ahead of time, bouncing a laser off shit and having it come back. So they're mapping to the inch, the entire environment ahead of time. And then essentially what they're doing after they've done this with extremely expensive hardware is driving through a course they've already mapped in high definition. It's like it's on tracks on rails as long as nothing changes it can go through this course but if anything changes whatsoever it's a death machine on wheels or it just pulls over and asks for daddy to help tesla's produced a form of intelligence where over time you'll be able to essentially drop a tesla vehicle anywhere on earth and with its brain it's going to look out into the world and go okay that's a road i know what to do here that's a scalable solution cruise waymo there's no other company that i'm aware of that has a hope in hell of catching tesla there are a few companies that i've seen i don't even recall names who are attempting to solve an, a generalized form of autonomy, but they don't have the data at scale. And all the companies with the really brittle solution where they are reliant upon pre-mapping in HD and having to use LiDAR, they can't scale that. Never mind the fact that Tesla 400 IQ is selling products to customers, making a profit on it, and the products are potentially future robotaxis, but also training the software versus companies like Waymo spending hundred plus thousand dollars on hardware that they're not even producing themselves per robotaxi. How many miles at what cost per mile until you've broken even on that it's just there's the, nobody's attempting to do what tesla's doing at scale with autonomy what about in terms of actual ev manufacturers in terms of they're just unit sales who do you see as being unit sales probably byd could overtake tesla that's definitely a possibility but as i said earlier the, the clarification there is i'm talking about revenue and profits in particular yeah. byd's business is just way too complicated yeah they have too many products not enough simplicity. So they may very well overtake Tesla. Keep in mind, by the way, BYD has a huge unfair advantage, one that they've earned though, in that they're selling vehicles for half or a third the price of a Tesla on average. There's many more consumers who can afford to purchase a BYD in China in particular than a Tesla. Just imagine what happens as Tesla continues to drive their costs down and they start getting toward those same price points. If they're already at matching BYD in China in terms of revenue, which is two vehicle models at much higher prices what happens when tesla's modular manufacturing system has kicked off and they're producing these vehicles for a meaningfully lower price do you think tesla are going to use the modular manufacturing system for their existing cars or are you talking about new cars new models both yeah i mean oh, over the long term it probably won't happen maybe for the model s and x but i think they will implement these as the interim steps for the model 3 and y and then the next gen vehicle everything will be modular 
it just makes sense. It's going to dramatically lower the cost to produce vehicles and the speed. You probably know that I have a Cybertruck reservation. I ordered on the same day that it was revealed. Do you think they'll ever come outside of America? Do you think they'll ever come to us? I mean, Australia, there's a lot of pre-orders. There's more than 30,000. But do you I think, think that they will get outside of the US, but I think Tesla has to make the decision, speaking about product simplicity, are they going to make one global Cybertruck, which means caters to every possible conceivable restriction globally, which is going to be challenging? Or do they have 12 different Cybertrucks depending on the region? And that mm. doesn't make a lot of sense. So if they yeah. do release a Cybertruck outside of the US, they're probably going to produce a single model in terms of its dimensions and specifications that would suit every other region. And that's going to be very difficult. It's not going to be the same thing. I personally would just recommend importing one from the US if you really want. <laughs> yeah, I've thought about that. I've thought about that. Yeah. And then getting it all converted to right-hand drive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I will. Maybe when they're um, yeah, I wouldn't be holding your breath for a, a local Australian version of the Cybertruck. Let's just let's just say that wouldn't be holding my breath. Yeah. Okay. What about all right? One final thing, man. Forty six eighty battery cells. For me, I don't think they're a positive. I think it's just a waste of money. The reason being that, say, a, a rival battery, say, Cadles Shenzhen Plus. Battery. Yeah, the energy density is a bit lower, but there's so many advantages to they're much cheaper to produce. Um, batteries in theoretically would last longer. I mean, even Tesla, Ford, and General Motors all now want to produce these new latest LFP batteries from Cadle under license in the United States. Do you think the 4680 battery will be a significant part of Tesla's future? Um, obviously, Tesla mentioned licensing um, Cadle's batteries. Why are they mentioning that if the 4680 battery is so compelling? What do you see Tesla's like battery strategy over the next five years being? Yeah, well, the short story is Tesla's going to need a fuckload more batteries today than they currently have access to in the future. True. And they're not dumb enough to leave their future in solely in the hands of other companies. Good point. So they need to bring in-house everything they possibly can that that is controllable. So that's what they're doing. I think over time, the 4680 is probably going to become industry leading. The form factor makes sense. Forget about the chemistry. Mm. I think that the 4680 is going to become the industry standard for form factor for batteries in vehicles. Maybe not so in storage products. The energy density, the ability to use those cells as a structural battery pack, it seems to be a no-brainer. Now, obviously, Tesla is currently not a battery expert, although I could argue that they are, but that is something that they took on as a project to control their own future, their own destiny. Mm -hmm. And it's still very early days. We saw actually just a couple of days ago, they announced the production of the 100 millionth 4680 cell. Yeah. The, it took 45 months yeah. to produce the first 50 million and three months to produce the next 50 million. I saw that, yeah. That is an astronomical acceleration in terms of production. And Tesla's going to need these cells for their vehicles, for storage products, and ultimately, I think, over the long term to supply to other companies. Oh, you're saying Tesla so, will use 4680 for storage, energy storage? I think it's quite, well, I don't know for sure, but I think over the long term, it's possible, if not probable. Te basically, the way that I think about is this. Tesla's all in on one form factor for their own battery production. They're only making 4680s. They're going to be selling as many energy storage products as they possibly can for years to come and producing a shitload of vehicles as well. Tesla's going to ramp the 4680 as fast as they possibly can. And at some point, if they can get beyond the necessary cells to put in their own vehicles, the next obvious place to put those, if they can drive their own costs down, because forget about what's currently being used in the storage products. If Tesla's producing their own cells, they're not buying from someone else. All other things being equal, it will be cheaper for Tesla to make their own cells because they're not paying another company who's making a profit on the sale of those cells to Tesla. So if Tesla can ramp up the 4680 cell production above and beyond the needs for their own automotive business, why would they not do that? It would probably be cheaper for them to do that than use different types of cells in their storage products and continue to scale and scale and scale and then eventually start selling those to other companies. Now, I'm not Tesla. I don't know that for a fact that that's what they're going to do, but I can tell you for certain that Tesla's going to ramp the 4680 as fast as they possibly can. And at some point, they're producing more of those than they need for their vehicles. So then what do they do? They either sell them to other companies, slow down their rate of production, or start putting them into energy products. And I think they'll go vehicles first, max it out, then energy, then sell to other companies. Didn't Elon Musk say that he's giving his engineers till the end of the year, basically sunk cost bias. If they don't figure it out, then game over for 4680. Isn't well, I don't what? know if he might have said that. I didn't, didn't hear that. It's definitely possible. But Pretty Tesla good. has said previously that they need to buy batteries from everyone they possibly can and make them themselves as well. There's going to be a huge shortage, I think, of batteries over the long term. 
Check out Tesla's master plan part three in terms of how much yeah. energy. Some of that required. did mention LFP batteries, actually, lithium ion phosphate. Yeah, well, lithium ion phosphate, that's the chemistry. It's not actually the form factor. So For the sure. 4680. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not going to be using like the high density stuff in the, the storage products, but the form factor is the 4680. They can put any chemistry in those that they want. You're saying that they would potentially change the chemistry for energy storage 100%. products and use 4680? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. they're likely to do the, the same for their uh, lower performance vehicles too. If yeah. it, There's no point having extremely high energy density cells in a low performance robotaxi, right? <laughs> You're not trying to break zero to 60 time records in that. So mm. they're, they're, they definitely have LFP or something comparable. And I think over time, the chemistries are going to evolve even further to drive costs down. You'll lose a little bit of performance and energy density, but you're going to have a dramatic decrease in cost for the cells. Okay. Okay. Mate, I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been a pleasure. I've been thinking about it for a long time. And clearly, clearly, you have a lot of knowledge. You've, you're doing this every day, right? You're, every day you're analyzing, well, I assume... You are. You have a lot of knowledge, and I think it's very valuable to people to listen to what you've got to say. Um, but the thing is, to me, people, a lot of people can't don't like Tesla right now. They don't agree with what Musk is saying. Mm -hmm. They feel like he's supporting Trump, and they can't kind of handle that. Now, actually, before I go on, the election, who's going to win? What's your prediction? Um, well, just caveat. In 2016, I thought there's no way Trump wins. In 2020, I thought there's no way Trump doesn't win. So yeah. I'm zero from two. And with that said, <laughs> with that said I don't a zero from two. Okay, that's a bad track record. I personally believe that mm. Trump by a landslide is going to get most of the really? states. Yeah. I've been watching an incredible amount of content um, from YouTubers who've been interviewing people in different cities around the US. I mean, a lot of it. Just to yeah. hear people's opinions. And... There's a huge number of people who previously had voted Democrat who are now saying, look, I hate Trump, but the economy was better. My city was safer. I'm going to have to vote for the guy, even though I hate him this time around. And there's not a single person you're hearing who previously has voted for Trump who's not. And there's a lot of people who really wanted to vote for Kamala and are very disappointed. The first debate, she didn't really have any substantive policy at all. Just a lot of word salads, but... Like, how are you actually going to improve the economy? What are you going to do there? There wasn't a lot. Anyone with a brain can see she's hiding from the media. She's done a total of two interviews so far since she was announced as a candidate to an extremely democratic process of zero votes. And so I think most people uh, who wanted to give Kamala a go are just like, yeah, I can't really, you know, can't really do it. Well, that's my prediction. But again, I'm zero from two. So would, would you I... would you vote for Trump? Yeah. I mean, if I could, I'd speed run becoming a US citizen just to vote for the guy. I'm deeply concerned about the potential of a, um, a Harris administration. Yeah. She's she's a very dangerous woman. And I don't mean that. That's not hyperbole. She's Her economic policies are just incredibly brain dead. The, the proposal of potentially price controlling groceries, if you want people starving, great idea. The idea of giving $25,000 to the first home buyers without any new increase in housing supply is just going to cause huge inflation in the price of housing. Um She's got a lot of good vibes and uh, a lack of policy. And she's literally 180 on every major policy she's had previously. She suddenly, she, Trump joked about giving her a MAGA hat, and I think that's fair. Um, you know, there's a border where millions of people have come over in the last yeah. probably uh, three, four years, illegal immigrants. And Trump's very pro-immigration, legal, merit-based immigration, as am I. But this administration for the last three and a half years has intentionally just let people flood over the border unvetted they're doing catch and release instead of sending them back home so there's criminals and all kinds of by the way most of these people just want a better life for themselves but very destructive policies and the only reason i can see this having happened is to gain representatives in the senate based on the census and the population increase i think there's some pretty bad people and i personally would say that just in closing um kamala is just a and biden are just a puppet for the machine they're just empty vessels and Trump is an independent outsider who actually really wants to do what's right for the US. He has phenomenal foreign policy. When no new wars started, he's been very good in negotiating terms of, of foreign entities. He met with people like Kim Jong-un as well, which was very surprising at the time. There was Abraham Accords. 
the guy really wants to end the war in Ukraine. He talks to the media and like, so do you want Ukraine to win the war? And Trump will say, I just want people to stop dying, bro. Whereas uh, the Biden administration actually thwarted a potential peace negotiation early on in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So I'm, I'm deeply concerned about a, a possible Harris administration. And it's nothing personal against her. I just don't think she's competent to be a leader. And she's certainly not the kind of person that would instill any sense of fear in other countries around the world. You're going to have countries just pointing and laughing, going, this cackling idiot is now running the US. I think a lot of bad actors will be... I mean, and obviously Putin recently endorsed Kamala as well. Did he? Yes, and he was trolling quite... I mean, obviously, he'd rather that than Trump, who, you know, has threatened Putin quite seriously in the past not to mess with the US. Uh, but yeah, Putin was laughing. He's saying, she's a wonderful laugh and all kinds of things like this. He's, he's okay. trolling, but he okay. did strongly endorse her because that would be the best thing for him, weak leadership. Since the Biden administration has been in, though, there has been an enormous investment. I mean, we're talking... I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that we went from very relatively small investment in EVs and batteries, and that has gone just... There's now been more investment into that technology in America than there is in China over the last. Mm -hmm. um, future investments are enormous in that industry. Mm -hmm. Solar, the capacity to build solar has increased sixfold in the last, mm -hmm. um, for, I, th I think, the last two years. So there's been this incredible increase in the investment in technology, which is the future, obviously, electric cars, of renewable yeah. energy. Trump is saying he would end that. That's my concern potentially under a Trump administration that the those investments, that stimulus of those industries, which I think we need, could go. Is I that hope possible? it does. Oh, why? Yeah, I don't think that the Biden administration can really take credit for much of this investment. It was inevitable. The companies that are producing these products need to invest in local supply chain and building out infrastructure in the US regardless and I don't think that the government should be getting involved in this. It's technologically and economically inevitable that this transition happens. The government doesn't need to be incentivizing people to build charging networks, invest in battery supply or production in the United States. It will happen regardless. That's my opinion. I don't think the government should be subsidizing the fossil fuel industry either, but I don't think they should be getting involved. This is like trying to subsidize people to adopt the internet 20 years ago. You don't need to. It's going to happen regardless. It's like subsidizing people to pick up smartphones 15 years ago. You don't need to. It's going to happen regardless. EV costs are coming down regardless. Tesla's investing in lithium refinement and production in the United States in local battery production. They've got their 4680 cells. Whether or not the government is incentivizing companies to localize their supply chains and build products, it doesn't matter. However, I will say on Trump, he is absolutely adamant of massively scaling US manufacturing jobs. And that's actually going to be a hugely positive thing for the entire industry. Because if he's dead set on more manufacturing jobs in the US, and you have a burgeoning industry for electric vehicle production in the US and batteries and solar, what do you think is going to happen? Every company that's going to create tens of thousands of jobs in the United States is going to have massive tax incentives to do this stuff locally. That is a much better way to produce and localize supply chain and production of these products and technologies in the United States than throwing money at companies. Instead, incentivize the manufacturing jobs. Everything else will take care of itself. Like I said, this technology is happening regardless. And I don't think the government should be getting involved with these tariffs I don't think that there should be import duties on Chinese-made electric vehicles. I totally disagree with that. Both the Harris administration, Biden-Harris administration and Trump are all for the tariffs. I think you should give consumers a choice, let the market compete and let the chips fall where they may. So I strongly disagree with the tariffs. But I think overall, a Trump administration is actually the best thing that could happen for the EV and energy industry in the United States because he's absolutely obsessed with US manufacturing. And the number of manufacturing jobs that will be created by scaling EV production, battery storage products, and batteries in the United States will be astronomical. But isn't isn't Trump anti EV? No. He's made a few comments saying he mocking EVs and saying they're well, of course he's pandering to the fossil fuel industries where the voters are in certain states where the entire state is dependent on the fossil fuel based industry. He's roasted electric vehicles repeatedly, joking about them not having enough range and you can't go yeah. here and rah rah. But yeah. he's very clear on the record. He's totally fine with electric vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles. Just consumers should have choice. And I completely agree. I think the government should piss off and let people decide because, like I said, this technology is going to keep getting better and cheaper over time. And 10 years from now, all the companies producing ice vehicles will be out of business. So you don't need to tell companies, hey, stop making ice vehicles by 2030 because they're not going to be in business anyway. There's no need for the government to get involved in that. But to be clear, Trump is not anti-EV. 
he certainly panders to his voter base in the fossil fuel based states as you do because everyone imagine you work in the fossil fuel based industry you see electric vehicles as a threat right like all politicians he panders completely to these voters so you think he's just making it up he doesn't really believe those things he's just saying it to pander to them no, he's, he's not saying that electric vehicles are good or bad. He's been quite neutral on that, saying, I'm all for electric vehicles, but the overarching principle there is people should have freedom of choice. When he's speaking to a crowd, however, in a, a state where it's predominantly fossil fuel, he's, of course he's going to roast electric vehicles. He's, he doesn't say he's anti-electric vehicles. He doesn't say there shouldn't be electric vehicles. But when he's pandering to a crowd in one of these industries, he's going to joke about electric vehicles and joke about them not having enough range and joke about the fact you can't tell anything. But that's very different from him being opposed to electric vehicles. He's completely open. And remember, he and Elon Musk have become quite close and have a strong working relationship now. He want, Trump wants American manufacturing jobs. Elon Musk is one of the biggest employers of manufacturing jobs in the United States, and it's going to continue to scale. The Optimus Humanoid Robots, the electric vehicles, they'll have a lot of discussions about how to incentivize and create manufacturing jobs in the US. And I think it's actually going to be an extremely positive thing for the EV industry, for the energy storage industry, and also for Tesla overall. If the borders are open and the Chinese government is obviously subsidizing its EV industry pretty significantly, hundreds of billions, and the American government isn't subsidizing their industry, how do they compete? That's not a level playing field. How would they? No, it's not. And this is part of the justification for the current tariffs, although they're not in proportion. I think the EU actually imposed tariffs, which were attempting to kind of level the playing yeah. field for this. Yeah. I do think there is certainly room for discussion. I personally think that a Trump administration or a Harris administration should talk to the CCP and say, look, guys, we need to figure something out because if you're subsidizing products coming into the US, it's not fair for us. Maybe you can sort of you know, play a little bit of hardball and impose some restrictions on trade, or at least to incentivize, because at this point in time, it's totally not a level playing field. But my broader point here is I personally think that consumers should have the choice to purchase products for whatever price they are available globally with or without tariffs. But you do raise an important point. It's not a level playing field. It's not fair. But I don't think that the government should be imposing huge tariffs on these products coming from overseas, which means at the end of the day, the consumers lose. I don't think it's the right thing to do because it's not in the interest of consumers. But it is in the interest of the companies who are probably going to get put out of business by the Chinese EV makers who are subsidized by the CCP. I do remind you again, though, Tesla is currently matching BYD for revenue in China without CCP subsidies. So, I mean, I think Tesla will be fine in this situation. It's just the companies that are already doomed are probably going to go out of business even sooner. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, GM, Ford, everyone, Toyota, their sales in China are shrinking very quickly. Yeah, I think that they're yeah. running for the exits uh, quite quickly. You've said today, right, and I agree with you, Tesla's main advantage and it's significant, over their rivals is artificial intelligence, right? And that's what they need to... I mean, a bot is not really the machinery. It's the it's the AI, I think so. Yeah. And same thing, full self, yeah. same thing with full self-driving. Anyone can stick a bunch of cameras and line eyes on a car or cameras and whatever sensors you need. It's the artificial intelligence. However, somebody already stole their source code. Could they do that again? I mean, is that, is that, not, a, ri yeah. is that a risk potentially? And stealing the source code will get you part of the way there, but it's not going to solve the problem. And there's certainly a risk that somebody could do that again, but that's not the whole... <laughs> you, you need a magic button that could steal Tesla's training, compute, their infrastructure, and all of their talent as well to, to have a hope in hell. So I don't see that as a major risk. What, what about... Is there a risk for Tesla? What's the, one, what's the number one risk for Tesla? For autonomy or for Tesla the company? What's, what's the question? Tesla the company, yeah, yeah. I'd probably say... Uh, World War Three. <laughs> yeah, that's a risk. Yeah, maybe an asteroid impact. No, but, you know, things within the sphere of, within Tesla's control, essentially, what would be their risk? Well, they've got a huge advantage with electric vehicle costs, and that's not going away. They have the data advantage with AI. That's not going away. I mean, if Elon Musk went absolutely crazy, lost his mind, took a few years and he secretly suddenly sabotaged the company, maybe that that would be a risk. I mean, it's not a reasonable one, but I'm scraping the bottom yeah. of the barrel here. I am quite confident to say that Tesla will dominate electric vehicles in terms of number of vehicles produced and or revenue and or profits from those vehicles. They're in a dominant position with autonomy. Yeah. They will scale widely. That's not changing. They may fail with the humanoid robots. That could be a risk. The biggest risk, I think, 
the biggest genuine risk for Tesla is artificial general intelligence just changing everything so much that things occur that I just couldn't imagine. Yeah. With my tiny little, you know, human brain, I just can't foresee. That's a situation where all bets are off. We enter that era of hyperabundance. Artificial superintelligence changes everything. Suddenly AI can solve problems with the click of a finger that yeah. would have taken years otherwise. I think that is the biggest genuine risk. Mm. But it's so unclear and difficult to predict what that would look like. That like what are you going to do? Can you yeah, I agree with you 100 percent That is that is the only possible possible significant risk to everyone. In fact, every company. Mm. Can you give us a what you estimate when Tesla will actually get full self-driving, um, say, legalized in the United States. Do you yeah. have a, an idea of what your thoughts are? Yeah. Well, I first will say that if they wanted to now, they could already be operating robotaxis in some pockets of California. And this is obvious. You just have to watch the intervention-free drives in certain places in San Francisco. They can obviously do that already. They haven't. Mm. It's their decision as to when they go to regulators with the amount of data and show how much safer their vehicles are than humans. We're now seeing us actually smart summon in the parking lots. That was kind of the last piece of the puzzle. They've nailed highways. They've nailed cities. They've nailed those. Now, obviously, the software isn't perfect and doesn't work everywhere equally as well. But I personally believe in the next 12 to 24 months, they'll have their first robot taxis operating. Not sure. everywhere. Not widely. But that'll be at some point over the next 12 to 24 months, they will have regulatory approval, at least in one region in the US, probably California, maybe elsewhere, to operate the robot taxis. One, one to two years. Yes, and it, it could be sooner than that. See, the, th the caveat here is I didn't see chat GPT coming until it came. I didn't see mid-journey until it came. So mm. you have tend to have these hockey stick moments and capabilities out of nowhere. And so I don't know if that happens or not. Assuming it doesn't, that's my prediction. But if there's a major breakthrough in terms of capability, you kind of get to a tipping point, a certain threshold, it could be sooner. But that's my best guess, full 24 months. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nate, for talking to us.